I think we are headed for an economic recession. If I, it, it's, it's going to be different for different groups of people. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. We increasingly live in a bifurcated world. There's the rich who are doing just fine, and then there's everybody else who are increasingly just trying to hang on. This is no accident, explains today's expert, Dr. Nomi Prinz, economist and author of the new book, Permanent Distortion, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. She lays out how central planning policies, some intentional and some incompetent, directly laid the path to the extreme degree of wealth and social disparity we now suffer from today. How did we get here? And do we have any credible hope for rectifying things? For answers, we turn to Dr. Prinz. Nomi, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Great to have you back on the program. Can't wait to talk about your new book. I see it everywhere over the internet these days. Um, real quick, right before we get to it, um, let me just ask you my general starting off question just to set the stage here. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? The global economy is suffering right now um, for a lot of different reasons. One, of course, is high inflation that impacts consumers, impacts corporations, impacts that area in between, which are small businesses and not just in the United States, but from a global phenomenon perspective. Um, we have seen GDPs falling and stagnant throughout the world. And because of the increase in debt loads that governments and individuals have, I think that's going to continue um, to be a, a, a shadow over the economy going forward. Um, on the other hand, we've certainly seen uncertainty in the markets um, in different um, types of sectors, but I also think that once the Federal Reserve hits pause, which I believe it will in the middle of next year on its interest rate hike policy. Um, a lot of the money that's come out of the markets that's on the sidelines uh, will actually come back in. We've, we've seen bits of this um, with the, will, will the Fed say this? Will they do this? What's Powell gonna really mean um, over the last number of months? I think that continues um, towards the beginning of next year, maybe the first half of next year, but ultimately we are going to see a, a reduction in the pace of rate hikes. Um, in the U.S. and around the world, and then we'll see a pause next year. And then I think during the following year, which is election year again, 2024, uh, we're going to see uh, rates easing if we don't see more quantitative easing between now and then. Okay, um, great kicking off answer. Um, uh, we'll get into this later in the discussion, um, but it sounds like, if I hear you correctly, um, yeah, there'll be some continued um, market dyspepsia as the Fed continues to hike, but at some point it's going to pause. That's going to bring money back into the market. So you don't necessarily see a you know, total catastrophic collapse in the markets. It sounds like you, you see actually a period once the Fed pauses where market prices may get supported and start rising at least. Uh, I, I see that. Yeah, I see that. And again, on the other, on the flip side of that, or or the sort of real economy side of that, I, I don't see the two uh, keeping up with each other again when that happens. Um, you know that that is part of permanent distortion. This idea that um, there's there's other factors that relate to money that are involved in the markets, obviously, that don't make their way into the real economy. And that's on the upside of the markets. The downside of the markets, the economy, either way, um, is lagging. And I believe that we're in for a period of that as well. Okay, great. Um, and that is a great jumping off point into your book. Again, the title is Permanent Distortion, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. Um, and it starts, the book starts with the importance of money. And I've got a couple quotes I want to read. Real quick before I do, what prompted you to write the book? Uh, COVID. Um, <laughs> um, no, actually, um, the pandemic, because uh, the last book I'd written was was Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. And that pretty much took us into uh, 2018 and 2019 um, when the paperback came came out. And that was, of course, during a period of unprecedented until 2020 um, creation of money at the hands of central banks, particularly of the developed world, the Fed and, and the larger central banks. And of course, a uh, predominantly 0% interest rate global environment, a little bit up, a little bit negative, but, but on average, 0% uh, from the standpoint of developed countries and their central banks throughout the world. Um, and then we hit the pandemic. 
So the distortion that all this money manufacturing created during, during the post-financial crisis period and, and into the end of 2019, um, set that aside for a second. And now we have 2020, where the pandemic effectively closes economies around the world, creates massive amounts of uncertainty, shutdowns, um, and, and, and all of that. And, uh, and then a reproduction, a, an enhanced production of money happens in the wake of that. And that basically turbo boost markets relative to the real economy. Again, so it was really in July 2020 when the Fed's book um, hit about $9 trillion from about $4.1 trillion in the beginning of 2020 um, and before the pandemic that um, I decided that this was not the normal distortion at operation. This was a permanent distortion where the markets were always going to be able to look towards being saved and whatever the amount is or was or will be that the central banks deemed are ne is needed um, by central banks, particularly in, in the larger nations and particularly with respect to the Fed. And that, that's where we are now, even with the Fed um, having raised rates during this year. Right, right. OK, and, and we'll come back to that in a moment because Powell is, is trying to disabuse folks of that conclusion. Um, that, uh, you know, hey, nope, I'm, I'm going to be the tough sheriff. I'm going to be the guy that pulls the the punch pull away. Now, of course, he's doing it, you know, like on day five of the party, if we want to use a, a party analogy. I mean, he's, he's they've been the great enabler up until this moment. Um, and, and my sense is you're skeptical that he's actually really going to pull, pull off that, that role. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of at the heart of your book, right? Which is that we, we've had this... Um, this departure between the real economy and its status and and what's happening with money and, and and the markets obviously react to all this this money and nomi you and i have talked for years we could have had a rip roaring discussion about this back in 2019 uh, but to your point things just got taken into the the territory of the absurd starting in 2020 and then in 2021 both with the Fed and the other central banks just, you know, doubling their balance sheets. Um, and then, of course, you had the fiscal stimulus on top of this that was, you know, in the U.S., it was even greater than the monetary stimulus, right? So uh, to your point, turbo boosting, you know, markets to a an extent that had absolutely no bearing on what was happening in the real economy, which, of course, back in 2020 was in lockdown for a good chunk of the year. Um, all right. So on this theme of money, uh, your book starts with this quote. The earth may spin on its axis, but the world revolves around money, populism, nationalism, isolationism, corruption, trade wars, military wars, health crises, inequality, economic hardship, and financial market bubbles. All of them are connected to money. And I love this next point. Money doesn't just drive a wedge between different classes, races, genders, and countries. It is the wedge. Um, I'm going to read one more quote, and then I'm going to let you chime in here. Uh, the economy and high finance do coexist, but they don't have much to do with each other when you dig beneath the surface. This is just what we were talking about. Money is the obvious divider. The reality is that money, like a virus, will always seek the easiest way to reproduce itself. And that's the problem here, right? That money has been reproducing at a much faster rate than the real stuff that it's a claim on, correct? That's exactly right. And, and, and there's the sort of timeliness of the pandemic and the the fact that I equated uh, money with 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 a virus because that's the reality. Like money, money looks for hosts, right? And money looks for um, if if we consider it as an abstract, um, the places where it can multiply the, the quickest with the least path of resistance. And the reality is um, that money in general can even when the markets are, are, are down periodically, mar money can reproduce itself more quickly um, in the financial markets and the financial asset markets than it can in the real economy. If you need to build a bridge and you need to have it financed and you need to pay for engineers and you need to have plans, and you need to worry about weather and you need to worry about which government's in office and then you need to worry about which private companies are involved and whether they can continue the job. And then you've got workers. And, you know, there, There's so many more things that have to be in place for money to manufacture money off of itself in the real economy, that the easier it is to flow elsewhere and the more fabricated it is in, in recent times from the standpoint of, of the central banks and to a, a lesser, much lesser extent, the, 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 the fiscal policy of the government during COVID. But, but all of that creates more and more of a chasm as to how money is created, where it goes, and, and specifically also where it doesn't go, which creates this, this permanent distortion 
between the two. Right. Um, and that's a great point to, to make, which is if we if, if, if the economy were self-funding something like like development, like building bridges and stuff like that, in theory, OK, we'd have to have people and companies go out and, and do things to make money and then we'd have to tax it and then we'd have to collect those tax revenues. And whatever those tax revenues are, that would place a limit on on how much we could invest, right? Whereas, you know, U.S. government could just sell a bunch of U.S. treasuries to the Federal Reserve and then just, you know, get that instant money and, and we voila, we have a stimulus package, right? So it, it's it's so easy to sort of conjure money in the, the on the financial side of things than to actually wait for the real economy to produce it. Well, well, that that that's absolutely true. But 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 beyond that, with respect to you know, just take the fiscal package that the fiscal packages that were created by the U.S. and other governments in the wake of the pandemic. That the reality is that the Federal Reserve created more money than what was on offer through those fiscal packages in general. So what happened was, even if you add up, and I, I look at the stats on this in my book, in permanent distortion, if you add up you know, all of those $600 paychecks, the, the extra unemployment insurance, the money that backed the PPP loans, if you literally add all of that up, it's still only a fraction, um, around 20% fraction of what the Fed created sort of in that same time period. Right. So the, the, the price tags, if you will, on the fiscal stimulus packages were, were, were pretty large. But when you dig down to how the money got used and where it got used, who drew on it and where that money went versus the fact that the central banks, the Fed in particular, created way more than that during that period. And a lot of that, obviously, we saw the markets basically go you know, way back, way, way up over their, their lows um, during that period. That money is still kind of on offer to the market. So if we consider that the Fed's book went up to $9 trillion by you know, a few months after the pandemic started, um, and the size-ish of the fiscal package that was actually used um, was more like one to one and a half trillion dollars, and forget about tax revenues coming and all the debt was created, all the extra expenses that separately went on to the budget, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that isn't, that, that's only a fraction again of what the Fed created. And, and the period of the Fed creating that sort of 4.7, 4.8 trillion dollars in, in all of 2020, they, they started to create a little bit more from their lows in 2019 at 3.7 trillion through the beginning before the pandemic of 2020 to get up to 4.1. So increasing their book by about 10 or so percent already because Wall Street was having a liquidity crisis. So already we were, we were seeing the creep of what the Fed would do if there was some kind of a crisis, but in a little way. And then of course we have the pandemic and expanded from there. So, so all of this ushered money into the financial system, which, which we know. But, but as of today, the, the size of the Fed's book, even though it's been increasing rates, the size of the Fed's book is only about $200 billion or so less than it was at its height in 2020. Right. The money that went to people's fiscal stimulus checks, the money that went to PPP loans for small businesses, that's all sort of in the wash. Whatever that has or hasn't done is already into some component of the economy, which we see now is starting to slow down anyway. Um, but the money that's there, that's still on offer for the bond market, for the stock market, therefore, for leverage by the financial system is pretty much still in place. So that's why, for example, when, when, when Powell talks about being tough on inflation and sort of monetary policy, and we're going to let bonds roll off of our books and all of that, but when you look at the actual numbers, um, the Fed has a real fear, of course, of selling off bonds from its books, because that would actually crash the markets, buy more right. um, than raising rates could ever do. And therefore, they're not going to do that. And, and therefore, we're in this world where there's a permanent sort of amphetamine injection of money into the markets. And central banks can come back on tap on that process of creating money, as we saw recently with the Bank of England, at any time. Yeah. Um, all right. Gosh, there's so much to dig into here. Um, I got one of the, your quotes I want to get to in a second. But the, the, uh, uh, back to you talking about um, money likes to find hosts, right, to, where it can replicate. Um First off, I'm sure a lot of our viewers here would love to be a host. Um, and, and that's the problem is uh, the way in which this, this hyper creation of money is distributed is just unbelievably unfair, right? It goes to, uh, it's extremely preferential, right? It goes to 
big institutions and it goes to the already wealthy, um, it, 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 it doesn't make its way in any sort of equal fashion out there into the world, right? So you've got already very advantaged parties who are benefiting tremendously from a lot of this and then everybody else, uh, it's sort of has to go suck eggs, right? Um, all right, so here's the quote from your book. Central banks have become money dealers and inequity enablers. When faced with crisis, they zoomed past being lenders of last resort and being arbiters, arbiters of who wins and loses in the economy. Their policies are setting up future crises and systemic economic fractures. So a couple of questions coming out of that. First is, um, let's talk about the potential systemic economic fractures. What's on your hit list there as like potential candidates? Where, where are the worry spots for you? So for example, right now we've got debt as a major worry spot and in and, 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 and a number of different ways. Um, with rates going up so quickly to sort of combat part of the inflation was caused by central banks, but a lot of inflation that was not caused by central banks, but nonetheless, um, we are already seeing delinquencies rise for mortgages, for autos, for personal loans, for credit card debt. We're seeing credit card debt higher at higher rates and not to buy really fancy things, but to do things like pay electricity bills. Um, right. right now, there are 50% more people having to turn to their higher rated credit cards to pay higher cost electricity um, than before. So there's, there's a burden that's coming to um, the average consumer in, in a lot of different ways right now. And, and that's not going to um, end well, not for, not for consumers and not for the general economy. Our savings rate right now has literally fallen off a cliff. So the idea of, of you know, central banks or, 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 or sort of the economists that support what they're doing, um, saying that, well, you know, raising rates is going to incentivize people to take money out of the market and you know to put it in savings accounts or, or just you know take it out for later not not buy things with it and therefore cause prices to go up it is not true when you look at the actual data which is a a, a cliff fall again of savings rates so you've got consumers who are are have run out of their savings are are taking on debt are taking on higher cost debt and are doing it to pay for things that cost more. And on the other hand, you have companies that are charging more because they're trying to do the same thing. They just have more of a, of a, of a deeper pocket situation than individuals mm -hmm. have. So, so that is a that is a real worry. And that is happening um, around the world. It's particularly happening in the United States. So whereas, for example, we might have not have the same level of energy crisis looming predictions that exist currently in the UK um, or in Europe, for example, um, we still have here a much higher um, cost of energy, a much higher cost of credit, and a much quicker increasing um, number of delinquencies. And, and that can relate to the mortgage market, that can relate to um, a, a different kind of a repeat of what happened really in the lead up to the financial crisis of 2008, with a lot of banks extended in a different way. Um, and a lot of lenders also extended and being extended in, in a different way than, than that we saw because home prices went up by so much um, with right. the money sort of flowing into them in the wake of the pandemic. So there's there's that. And then there's just a general fact um, that from the standpoint of the U.S. Treasury debt, which is now at $31 trillion, um, it was a $9 trillion going into the financial crisis in 2008 before um, lots of other things happened, including central banks stepped in to, like you said, buy some of that debt through the financial system. So basically, Treasury borrows money, banks are the primary dealers to sell that borrowing or those debt, that debt to the rest of the world, other central banks, pension funds, et cetera. Um, and then they sort of give it to the Fed in return for cash um, for which they don't have any accountability. And then the Fed holds the, the, the bonds on their books, whether mortgage bonds or, or treasury bonds all connected to treasury debt. So the government is being monetized by the Fed, um, not just our government, governments around the world. In countries that are less stable economically, um, where they have to borrow more and their currencies are weaker relative to the growth of their economies and the, the health of their consumers and their citizens, that becomes more and more of a problem to pay back. Throw into that the high dollar right. and all of that debt becomes more expensive and, and countries' relative trade balances get, get hurt as well. So there's a lot of, lot of problem areas um, in, in this entire scenario. Um, first, because of the creation of the debt, when money was injected and rates were so cheap. And now because of the sort of quickness of interest rate hikes on the back of that um, in, in this manner, which is just causing more credit squeezes. So, so these, are, these are real trouble spots that are um, not going away anytime soon. 
Okay, so so we've got our, our economy, the cat, and it's in a room full of rocking chairs, right? There's a lot, of, you've, you've just enumerated a whole bunch of them for us. Okay, um, and I do just want to underscore one thing you said there, because I really want to make sure people understand this. The, the, the federal debt was at $9 trillion back in 2008. And no, I'm sure you remember, you were probably writing some of these things back then, but I remember reading back then the alarm bells that people like you were ringing about our, our, our sovereign debt challenge back then, right? Mm -hmm. We're now, what, 14 years down the road? Not that long. Um, we are three and a half times yeah. that balance right now. It's amazing. I mean, it's it's amazing. And, and you can't really attribute all of that to COVID, right? I mean, there's, there, there's a lot of other things at work here, um, all of which point to the fact that our economy is not growing enough to effectively pay into the government enough to create any sort of stability in, in the budget. And again, this is not just our country, this is going on throughout the world. And one of the ways to mitigate this additional cost has been to allow central banks, when I say allow, I say that very specifically because Congress could technically put a cap on what the Fed does if they so wanted to, they just, sure. they don't, they don't really even get it. Um, and, and as a result, um, governments can rely on central banks and therefore become lazy, really, in how they manage their budgets or how they plan for economic growth, um, because they, they, they have this, this enabler. That's the, the word I used in my book that you read so eloquently. I mean, that, that is a reality as well, outside of how Wall Street, how the financial community can leverage um, cheap money or, or trade around more expensive money when it, when it comes into play as well. Well, so so let's let's grab onto this with both hands for a second here. So um, I'll, I'll try to find a, a chart of the federal debt here in the U.S. But if you see it, it's an exponential chart, right? right. Um, and with an exponential, it, 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 it every new period grows more than the periods before it, right? It's right. this sort of speeding up process, both in terms right. of time and in terms of magnitude. Right. Um, and uh, first off, you know. The folks running the show, certainly in in, in Congress, it, it, you know, most of them don't they don't understand economics very well. They certainly don't understand exponential functions very well. But when you look at an exponential function like this, what it is doing is you are essentially pulling tomorrow's prosperity into today when we borrow the way that we're borrowing to kind of keep things going just a little bit longer. Right. Mm -hmm. So almost mathematically, we're setting ourselves up for a, for a big future reckoning. Right. Uh, but nobody really cares because they just want to keep everything together while they're in office. That's and right. if this has a bad end in the future, well, that's somebody else's problem to deal with. Right. Um, well, and also if there's little things going on during during the time, like little things like people being burdened by by debt and costs during this period of time, um, it doesn't quite matter relative to, for example, what the markets might do or what they might do when the Fed pauses. Um, or when the Fed cuts rates because it, it it becomes obvious that they're not able to really fight real inflation and that also the economy is suffering at some point. Um, so 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 there's all these like things that can happen in between. But you know that nine trillion dumb, dumb number is very important for two reasons. One, because it was the debt going into the financial crisis of the United States, and also because it is about um, the size of the Fed's book. So if you just if you just think about that conceptually. And I'm not saying this is going to happen, but if you just, just think about that, and, and, and the book's not all treasuries, it's mortgage bonds, but they are related to treasuries. And so there's a connection on debt there. But, but technically what that implies, mathematically, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, is that the Fed's book could at some point be 31 trillion. I'm right. not saying it will. I'm just saying, I don't think we thought it could have been nine when it was a four and a half. Um, and I don't think we thought it could have been four and a half when that started out at nine. Right. And again, well, this, this and, is so, so interrupt you, but but when the when the federal debt was at nine trillion, correct in 08, what was the Fed's book? I think it was like eight hundred billion. Well, it started right. out eight hundred billion. That's right, and then it, yeah. it went up to four and a half trillion through the, the through the the three QE um, cycles. But but yeah, we, we couldn't have even imagined like that was going to actually happen. Exactly. Um, My point is just as much as we our minds are blown by the increase in the debt, the increase in the Fed balance sheet is just like on yes. steroids. Yes, exactly. And though they are not causal, there is certainly a relationship um, between both of those numbers um, being able to grow. Of course, the accelerated, as you said, exponential function of U.S. debt 
um, but also the fact that there is a sort of other entity that's around to help sort of be a buyer for that debt because other buyers for that debt because it is so immense. Um, like the Bank of Japan, like the Bank of China have really stepped off the they haven't kept up with our increase um, of debt so and the same thing around the world so central banks are stepping in to basically massage um, some of the uh, the debt loads of their of their governments in a sort of backdoor way. Okay. Um, well, look, um, uh, that opens up a question, right? Which is, <laughs> um, at some point in time, uh, you know, if, if if the Fed sort of truly become well, before I get to that question, let, let me let me go back to something I said earlier. I said that um, in the intro that there were central planning policies, some intentional uh, and some incompetent, right? And I feel like that's kind of where we are right now, where I, I believe Jerome Powell and a lot of the folks running the Fed, they're not they're not idiot idiots. Um, but I think that they are faced with a lot of bad options, right? And so they're trying to figure out, okay, you know, how do we how do we keep this game going without inflation running amok? Right. And, um, you know, without the wheels coming off the economy, if we tighten things too hard. Right. Um, but they understand, given this debt, this, this, this exponentially increasing debt pile, you need inflation to keep that under control. Right. You, you need to bring down the cost of that debt as you're as you're adding to it. Right. But of course, the Fed got in trouble right now and it created more inflation than it could control. And that's that's what's going on right now. Right. So that's that I think is sort of the intentional part of it. But then I think on the Congress part of it, most people don't get this stuff at all. And they just sort of think of money magically, like, well, the government will just make more, the Fed will just print more up. And, and, and to them, the difference of adding a trillion or a $2 trillion stimulus package, it's just a number to them, right? A trillion is an unfathomably large amount of money. So, so much so that really even people like us that get it, I can't really fully grasp what a trillion right. is, right? Um, and now we're banding out, you know, sums of like 31 trillion and stuff. I mean, it's it's like right. fantasy num numbers at this point in time. So, um, you know, to me, the big concern I have about all this, this whole system is that this just can't continue forever like this, right? At some point, uh, even if the Fed ends up being the market or owning everything or owning all the debt or whatever, right? It's it's It doesn't equal... To your point about the the divorce between the markets and and the real economy, it doesn't mean real things. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we have more barrels of oil to run the economy with, or that we have more factories that are productive or a more productive workforce, right? So I just don't see how this blend of intentional can kicking plus incompetence of government equals anything other than just like some big future date with it all coming down. What, what do you think? Um, that, 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 that's the, that's the math of it. Um, you know, that, that's sort of chaotic. Um, and that's why, again, I call it permanent distortion where, where they're, they're, this, this, this divorce is permanent, right? It's not like they're going to re-meet. Um, what can happen is there can be pockets of, of money that are, you know, that sort of do get invested in, in, in real things that are, that are necessary and that are immediate, um, potential crises because we're still living in a world where these things happen. For example, in the energy markets, um, you know, we, we know that nothing the Fed did it created, um, you know, sort of the, the the situation where Russia invaded Ukraine, where, where pipelines were cut off, where natural gas supplies were limited, where there's sanctions going around back and forth between us, Europe, Russia. You know, the, the, the Fed did not create this. The Fed did not create the inflation associated with this. However, um, what that scenario has indicated is that the world in general needs to find more and better alternatives um, economically for energy, and 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 as a result. Um, you know, there, 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 there can be and there is um, investment in certain things that are very, very necessary throughout the energy spectrum, whether that's an oil, coal, clean energy, you know, wind, solar, that, 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 that will have some impact on that foundational part of the economy and, and on people's costs of, of things, right, over time. Does that have to do with, with um, what the Fed's doing? Um, and, and that's an important 
uh, thing to distinguish. I, I still believe that if there is a de debt crisis, that if Wall Street faces a liquidity crisis, that if that kind of problem emerges or for some other reason that we can't even envision yet, so not a pandemic where things are shut down and it's so obvious, but something else happens, um, that the Fed or any other central bank will step in indefinitely um, to create money and that this money will have an adverse propelling effect on the markets relative to the real economy. So it's not like the real economy is stagnant. It's just that that relationship is so out of whack that I, I do believe when there are whatever is deemed a, enough of a crisis for a central bank, they will step in. And a perfect example of this is, is very recently on a small scale, but the Bank of England stepped in and they manufactured 60 billion sterling worth of, of money to buy effectively UK government bonds or gilts. Why? They're fighting inflation, they're raising rates, they're talking about the same talk that, that Jerome Powell is talking about. However, they had a shortfall in being able to pay off pensioners. And also there was a lot of leverage going on in the guilt market to be able to pay off pensioners. And those two things reached ahead. There was just not enough money to be able to, um, or demand to be able to buy the real bonds. And so therefore uh, Bank of England stepped in to do that. I think similar situations can and will happen in the United States and with the larger central banks around the world who can and will manufacture money when they need to. So I don't see that big reckoning. That's why I call it a permanent distortion. I see a lot of mini crises along the way that will be met in different ways by a similar policy to what we've seen over the last 14 years. So um, I totally get it. And actually, I've, I've interviewed some folks recently that agree with you. Um, most notably is Joseph Wang, who was an open markets trader at the Fed for many years. And he, he basically says the same thing, which is um, he he's actually pretty sanguine about the markets. And, and for the main reason of that is he says he believes the Fed has all the tools that it needs at this point to step in and do exactly what you talked about. I kind of labeled it um, the, it's got the enough monetary duct tape uh, to step in and just right. whatever breaks, it can, it can patch it all together. Right. Um, right. And, and I, 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 so I get it. And I think that's a very important, um, uh, you know, uh, framework to be putting in front of people here to say, Hey, look, don't expect necessarily uh, the, the doom and gloom that a lot of other people are saying because the Fed may actually have more ability to keep everything together than than most people are expecting. Um, I, I don't want to rat hole in my earlier point. Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to re restate it, and you don't have to agree with it. But this whole kind of like the way in which we're we're going, I, I can see what you're talking about happen for the next bunch of years, <laughs> right? As I look forward in decades, I'm just thinking like, can we still be getting away with this in 2040 when you know the the national debt may be like 200 trillion and you know whatever? I don't know. I'm curious how permanent it is in the long, long run. But I think for our investing, you know, outlook for the next decade or two, it doesn't matter. What you're saying is probably what we really got to be keeping our eye on, right? So let me let me ask you this. So um uh you just outlaid, you know, some great reasons why where you think the economy can break and then or things that can break. Um, of course, if it's a if it's a liquidity type issue, the Fed can come in and patch things over, like you said. I'm wondering if some of these fractures, fracture points that might be more material in the long run are social fracture points where we talked about the inequity here. Right. And every time th those liquidity rescues come in. That's more money that's going into, you know, the pockets of the already elite, right, or already very rich or whatever, right? And you know, you just mentioned the plight of the average consumer right now with the savings rate or or, or, or plummeting. Um, I, I can't remember the chart, last chart I saw, but we're at rates we haven't seen for at least a decade or more, um, and uh, debt is now at. Uh, Revolving debt is now at record levels and it's increasing at record levels every month, right? So it's just showing that more and more people are kind of hanging by their fingernails and maybe even beginning to fall beneath the, the solvency line. And we're not really even in a big recession yet, or at least we're not in a bad recession yet. We can argue whether we're in recession yet or not, but I think that the brunt of the recession that 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 we could very well be due, I don't think is here yet, right? So point being is things could get even worse for these people. 
And it's a pretty big swath of America that's suffering like this. Do we get to a point where the average person says, this just isn't working for me no more? And, and I don't know what form that takes, but it's the kind of the pressure point at which the pitchforks come out or whatnot. You get some sort of social rebellion that says, we're not going to stand for these guys eternally getting you know, rescued while the rest of us just fall further and further behind. Is that something you worry about? I, I, I do. You know, we saw a lot of, um, and not just in the United States, but around the world, a lot of, uh, of an increased level of unrest for lots of different reasons. But as, as I think they all are most relate to money and sort of economic inequality and instability and just anxiety um, around the world in the wake of the financial crisis period, the money creation period, 2019, um, was the year um, they're talking about permanent extortion where it would, there was the most number of the most um, diverse sets of social um, demonstrations and social unrest that the world has seen. And this was mm -hmm. according to a number of, of stats and information, including um, an article by The Economist and, you know, like or don't like The Economist. But the reality is there's a lot of different sets of information that I aggregated to, to come up with. And that was before everything closed down. Um, so, so that was what was going on before there was closures, before there was more of a gush of money coming into the top, uh, more general economic instability, and then, of course, geopolitical instability and everything else. And I think we're now we're we're uh, we're going to another period like that. So I do think um, this specific time of the cost of money for developed countries anyway, increasing for, for real people, their debt burdens increasing. Um, small business, you know, this is just for individuals, this, this gets amplified at the small business level, at the medium business level. That's why you, you know, you cut back production that, that you know, or you, you cut back people. I think all of that's going to be happening um, as a result of, of where we came from, what's going on right now. Now, on the other side of that, I think that ultimately there's going to be an ease of some kind of policy, whether that is um, addressing liquidity issues um, or whether that's um, in some form of rate changes uh, in policy. And that's going to create a, a boost in the in the market. So you're going to continue to see um, that chasm and therefore, I think, an increase in, in social disruptions. And also I talk about this in the book, the flip flop on a, on a, on a, on a voting basis um, in terms of who's in office, who's not and how sort of angry people are at their sitting person versus, you know, the next sitting person and, and, and that sort of flip going on, you know, sort of between, you know, in general left and right, but it's really an economic, it's really a socioeconomic um, anxiety that's pushing political shifts to be accelerated. Um, and we're seeing that throughout the world. Again, another example, my, my favorite sort of um, example sets right now, I spent about a month um, in the UK recently, but is, um, you know, what's happening with the, uh, the prime minister yeah. evolution in the in, in the same party, um, you know. So, so there's just a lot of um, unease and incompetence, um, but that's related to to politics, but also that connects into economics and and just how people feel all around the world. Right. So you know when the Arab Spring was a great example of this, where yes. it was sort of sold to us as, oh, look at all these people, you know, rising up for democracy and whatnot. And, and my read on it was, no, it was people that basically had um, sudden extreme inflation where they could no longer afford to feed uh, or, or keep their families warm. And when that happens, you really have no choice but to rise up against who's ever in charge because they're failing you as a leader, right? So if I hear you correctly, it sounds like you, you think we could get into this sort of protracted period where it's just this chronic throw the bums out. You know, whoever's in power, look, if we're still suffering from these same things, I don't care if you were a Democrat or Republican or whatever, we're tossing you out because it's not working for me. We're going to bring the next guy in. And yeah, maybe he doesn't work out. So by the time his terms ended, we're just as frustrated with him as the other guy. We throw him out. And it's just you're, you're not really creating any sort of dynastic like, OK, we're trying to move the country ahead in this vector. It's just this isn't working. That's not working. This guy's not working. Sort of yeah, and, and it, no, that, that's exactly right. And, and, and the, the people that sort of rise to different levels of power in, in that entire scenario um, don't even have the time to do much more than try to survive um, sort of their period or say things that don't necessarily get acted upon, which politicians are good at anyway. I mean, that's not new, but right. but just the, the sort of the, the acceleration um, of that can be tied to the acceleration in um in, in how how money has been created for what and where it goes 
relative to where it doesn't, coupled by, again, all these other disruptive things that we're going to see, like, like, like debt crises, consumer debt crises, um, high inflation, I think is going to, it's going to be a particularly in the energy, food, fertilizer, the, the sort of basic need side um, for some time. And, and there's nothing any central bank can do about that. So when things do break from a liquidity standpoint, because companies ultimately can't pass on all the costs, or we see sort of mid and smaller level companies um, not being able to pay their loans or, or however that, that looks. Um, and then you have the banks coming back to the Fed and saying, look, we're having a liquidity situation here. Um, can you help us out? And, and I think their you know, help will arrive. And then again, that will, that will shoot back up through the market. So we're in this, again, this is like permanent distortive vortex of, of, of this behavior, a lot of which can be tied to the financial crisis and post pandemic, but that's currently embedded in the system and has all these other ramifications. Yeah, so we've just gone from economic to social, now we're in the political. Um, last point on the political side of things, do you think that one of the casualties of this is gonna be globalization? I mean, we're already beginning to see it, but as people are really hurting, they already seem to be looking for candidates that are more nationalistic and especially in areas like the EU, where it's like, okay, forget about the big European vision. I'm gonna talk about the plight of the French, you know, French people or Italian, Italy people or whatever. Um, and we're seeing, I think, maybe a little bit more of that, too, here in the States, too. I see you nodding as I'm saying this. Well, you know, it's there There was less of a sort of version of this in 2016 when, when you know, so the idea of, of being more domestically focused, um, sort of the new populism um, and the new isolations and all that was was pretty prevalent throughout the world. And, 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 and the leadership um, or, or, or you know, the political leaders coming into that were, you know, sort of leveraging that that idea that, you know, I, I can protect you, I can protect this country um, you know, here in the UK, in India. I mean, basically, and I, I go through the examples in the book, but that was something that was already latent. And, and there was a lot of economic stability, instability creeping back in after all of these years of Fed. Um, just again, not that it's familiar connected, but it kind of is. Um, that is Fed at all, all of a sudden, you know, pivoted back to just a teeny little bit of rate hikes and there was other stuff going on in the world and there was economic instability. And all of a sudden um, we saw a lot more of that sort of political isolationism, right. uh, step back from globalization and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we do um, the, the more the economies get refragmented more obviously um, right now, and you can't just tie it back to COVID. Um, I think the more that, that that's going to um, step up again, um, it hasn't gone away, but th that there, there are specific reasons that um, the inability of money to get to the real economy and, and the fear of what the real economy looks like and what people think about it and their own anxieties create a situation where, yeah, you want to kind of um, bring it back home. That said, it's not necessarily the best thing for the economies, but it, but it works well in terms of um, yeah, you know, in terms of winning elections. Getting elected, yeah, exactly. Um, and look, whether it's you know bad or good, you know, it just may be what is, and that's what we're trying right. to do is to just prepare people is. for what to expect, right? All right, so um, yes, I mean, talking about bringing it back home, I'm going to bring it back home to a comment you made right at the very beginning um, about you know, the Fed stepping in, uh, always providing liquidity, you know, when things get shaky. Um, and uh, you think that eventually the Fed's going to pivot, uh, or at least pause, um, and then capital is going to come back into the, the U.S. markets, at least. Um, so uh, uh, here's something from your book. Um, so so the, the, the fact that that, that that may happen doesn't mean that we might not have a shock beforehand that 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 needs to be the response to. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so you say in the book, without a significant monetary policy and debt overhaul, another crisis is inevitable. Markets will tank at first or periodically. Then banks and corporations will again turn to governments and central banks to save them at the expense of the real economy. The difference is, is that next time central banks might not be able to exert the same influence on markets or worse, they will. Right. So um, uh, we are in the middle of a bear market right now in the markets. Um, there's who knows what's going to happen from here, but um, certainly seems like we are headed towards recession at this part. And uh, there is still margin compression going on in corporate America. 
Um, we are seeing layoffs pick up. We're just seeing a lot of the storm clouds that suggest that, hey, we could be going for some protracted period here. We may have another bad year in the markets, right? Um, we could have you know some sort of crisis here, either big market correction, certainly looks like we have a big correction in housing. Um, there might be some economic breakage that we're unaware of yet, or you know, we're, we're seeing warning signs of, of liquidity drying up in a lot of markets, including the U.S. Treasury market itself. Yeah. So my, my question for you here is, given your macro outlook right now, um, uh, what do you think, I guess, what do you think next year is going to look like from a macroeconomic standpoint? Um, and uh, if you do think things are going to be worse, like, like how bad do you think it's going to be? Are we going to go into a bad recession here? Is this going to feel like a 01 or an 08, or is it going to feel different in some way? What, what do you think? I think we are headed for an economic recession. If I, it, it's it's going to be different for different groups of people. I think for the average American, the average citizen, um, there will be a recession in that whatever they get paid and whatever stability they they may or may not have with their jobs as it as it is right now, um, the cost of maintaining their life will increase relative to what they're bringing in and how comfortable they are. In that respect, we will have a recession. Um, and we already saw from the overall economic perspective two technical recession, you know, together periods of back-to-back of, right. of -back negative GDP. We saw slightly higher than that in the in the in the prior, you know, just the recent quarter. Um, but a lot of that was due to sort of one-offs um, relative to trade imbalances and other things. Right. We just saw jobless figures come out where on the one hand, you've got the establishment sort of payroll survey saying everything's awesome. And then you've got the household survey saying like, no, like we're losing our jobs. Um, and, and so, you know, the, there, there's definitely a recession coming for the real economy. From the standpoint of the markets, what's I believe going to happen is the Fed's going to um, sort of pivot in three stages. The first stage is going to be a reduction in the size of rate hikes because um, first of all, because Powell said that was going to happen. Um, and second, you know, either next meeting, the following meeting, but effectively, I think that means going to a 50, maybe another 50, maybe 25, and you're sort of yeah. still getting to around to 5%, but in a slightly different way. Um, and then checking the pulse of what's going on, that would be a pause. I think somewhere around that point, the markets actually pick up steam relative to the real economy again. And we start to see more of that, um, more of that chasm grow. Um, so I think net net, the markets are going to finish higher next year because all of that's going to transpire within the year. Now that's going to still be with a lot of volatility. What did he mean by that? Are they really going to do that? Is inflation too high? Was it really, you know, colder than everybody expected in Europe? So now natural gas prices are even higher there. So now our electricity bills are higher here. I mean, a lot of stuff can play into that. It's not going to be a it's not going to be a sort of cakewalk of a year um, by any standpoint, um, but but I, I think the markets will become more diverse for, divorced from the economy next year um, as a result of, of, of all of that. I do think there'll be sectors that will, um, from an investment standpoint, stay consistent and actually be um, a value on the investment side. Right, then let's go there. That was my next question. Um, <laughs> to pick up on that, um, I I I. I see throughout the energy spectrum, um, no matter um, what happens with respect to, you know, the elections and politics between midterms to the presidential election, whatever goes on, I think that on both sides of the aisle, um, there, there is a, a commitment to um, more energy independence, to energy that's cleaner, more sustainable, because that's just more economic, as well as solidifying what we have on the more traditional energy side, whether that be, might be oil refineries of natural gas, storage capabilities, battery capabilities for large um, installations and, and, and industries and so forth. So I see the entire energy space being um, a good investment. And I also see it as a sort of bipartisan investment. Um, and, and different parts of that that require certain commodities. So I'm going back to your globalization question. Mm -hmm. um, commodities that, that um, will be needed for both the transition and just the upgrading of, of current um, energy structures we have. Um, for example, like silver, for example, like copper. Um, on the battery side, for example, like lithium and nickel. On the nuclear power side, for example, like that and uranium. Um, so, so I think that the biggest opportunities from an investment standpoint um, lie in different parts of like the physical infrastructure of energy, the entire energy spectrum and the, and the materials 
um, that are needed to, to do that. And of course, selectively, um, which company is doing what and how well they're doing is, is, is a separate, you know, obviously an individual um, analysis, but, but I see that sector as Broadway doing well. I see the housing sector from the standpoint on the other side, of um, anything that has to do with refinancing, anything that has to do with financing, um, any automakers that have a significant portion of what they do related to leasing or financing, all um, underperforming next year because um, of the lack and lack of liquidity that, that's coming into the market, housing prices dipping, and people just not necessarily being able to stretch um, that far. So, uh, yeah, I, I see the pluses and, and, and minuses on, on all sides of that. Okay, great. So you gave us some good things to look at from sort of a, a bullish outlook standpoint and some things to look at from a bearish uh, outlook standpoint. It, it sounds like from, if I heard you correctly, you, don't let me put words in your mouth, but it sounds like from a probabilistic standpoint, you are not um, looking at like a big market, you know, flush out next year. And then, you know, so, so almost like a V market, right? We go into the year, we flush out, and then we end the year higher. Sounds like you're not saying that's what you see more likely. Sounds like you see more sort of a, a just kind of a, you know, I don't want to say muddling along, but, it, but it's kind of finding its way, but may kind of eventually kind of grind a little bit higher as the year goes on and close higher for the reasons that you mentioned earlier. That, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, we're, we're not out of volatility. We're not out of parsing what central banks will do relative to inflation figures or job figures that come in. Um, but I think those will be meet, met by what's happening in the real economy at some point. Um, and also, I think when we get some more clarity, um, which will really start with a reduction in the size of rate hikes. Um, and other central banks have already said they're going to be doing that. So this is something, again, that you know, we have to yeah. step back and look at the global picture um, into a pause. I think those two things both happen next year. And um, as a result, I do, I do ultimately see markets, if not the real economy, um, getting lifted because of that. Okay. Um, well, Nomi, look, this has been great. I'm looking at the time. We're beginning to come up on our hour here. Lots of questions I didn't get to. So we'll we'll definitely have to have you back on again in the not too distant future. Thank you. Um, so in in beginning to wrap up here, um, the book is permanent distortion. Um, we talked a lot about a lot of things that are largely um, you know, not super optimistic uh, in terms of how the system is going to be run. Um, not 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 super like end of the world either, um, which which is great. Um, we've definitely had some people on that are a lot more, I would say, you know, frightened about what could happen um, than it's than you appear to be. But you know, the viewers of this channel are are regular people. Um, they're just regular small investors that have worked hard to build some wealth and um, want to be good stewards of it. Want to be able to fund their and their families' life goals from here. Um, is there anything about the book and your conclusions in it that we haven't talked about yet that you'd like to impart to those people um uh either on a hey these are things that that you should do heading into a future of of permanent distortion or hey here's here's some more positive aspects walking into the future than we've had a chance to talk about here yeah well i am um, we, we didn't talk about sort of the last section of the book which i which i have um called metamorphosis um which is um really what what's happened on the side of for example decentralized finance you know people mm -hmm. doing more of their own um individual investing the platforms to be able to do that um much longer conversation not all those platforms are are the best ones to use some of them are more tied to wall street than others but but this idea of um us evolving to be uh, able to use more tools to be more proactive about our investments i think is something that has come out of this period and and i think that whole decentralized finance um, uh, just, just space, um, and not just from standpoint of cryptocurrency. That that's just an element, but basically all of decentralized finance and more P2P and more um, small businesses being uh, potentially capitalized more on the private basis, and, and individuals being able to partake in that and be more selective. I think I think this is something that is um, really building um, beneath the surface. It's it's taken a little bit of a backseat this year with all the uncertainty in the markets, but but it's there, um, and and I think that's just at its nascent stage. And so I do talk about that in the book. Um, I do talk about the retail rebel, I, I call it, and basically, um, you know, individuals on the one hand who, who kind of have, have come together to communicate um, on social media about what, what they're seeing and, 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 and where they're going with their money. But, but I think the takeaway from, from that on a broader level is that um, it, it is important, again, to be, um, to think 
with with your money, not necessarily just just sort of go into the the passive investment stage, which um, a lot of people are not to risk it all, not to bet the house, as it were, but to just to um, to take this period as one in which to just be more um, open to education and and proactivity um, in your money. I think that's going to serve people well. Um, I do talk about five sectors in the last chapter. Um, that I think are going to ultimately benefit from um, this relationship or this lack of relationship between overall markets and the real economy, where there will be pockets um, that nonetheless will, will find private capital as well as um, public capital, as well as um, other types of incentives. And um, we talked about energy um, as my, my, my favorite one right now for the immediate term, um, as well as infrastructure, which is, which is connected. Um, those are two of them. Um, I also talk about transformative technology um, as one. Obviously, right now, I wouldn't necessarily go whole hog into the technology sector until we get that pause um, or at least a, a severe reduction in rate hikes um, and their mm -hmm. pace next year. Um, but that's one I talk about meta reality, which is not gaming. <laughs> it's not Facebook. Um, it is, or, or this, their idea of meta, it's, it's the idea of actually um, technology that uses meta reality, AR and VR, to make our lives better. You know, to allow that surgeon on one side of the world to develop, um, you know, medical practices that can be used in a virtual way with someone on the other side of the world. So I talk about that as an area that I still, I still believe has a lot of growth ahead of it. And, and I mentioned decentralized finance and new money where, um, I, uh, you know, again, I think right now there's a bit more uncertainty in that area from the standpoint of, of uh, crypto or Bitcoin, but there's certainly um, more evolution that will be happening that will allow people to invest in that space and also use it for their own purposes. All right. Um, boy, that's painful to me. And I think painful to our viewers here, uh, Nomi, that we're we're ending with the tease of all of these topics without having had the time to really drill deeply into them. Well, I would love to have you back. <laughs> well, well we get the book and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But Nomi, would love to have you back on this uh, channel to, to dive deeply onto the solution side of things in the future. Folks, if you'd like to see that happen, please do me a favor. Let us know in the comments section below if there's the um, outpouring of demand for it, as I think there will be. Nomi, you'll be hearing from me soon to get you right back here on the channel. Um, real quick before we get to the book, uh, your your enthusiasm about decentralized finance, does, uh, let's say a, on a scale of one to five, five being super high, um, uh, what is your level of enthusiasm about uh us as a society being able to use decentralized finance as a way to sort of disintermediate the existing stranglehold that the current Wall Street system has around the financial system? Like, will it give us an opportunity to level the playing field better and, and take it out of the iron claws of these guys that have controlled it for so long? I, I absolutely, on a five, think it is a way. Um, I, I, I think... Um, just from the standpoint of, of um, where it is right now, there's obviously a lot of volatility in it. And, and I do think we um, it needs more of um, a set of regulations, not necessarily um, for the currency itself, but just to keep people safe from the standpoint of um, sort of more nefarious elements of, of you know, whoever can pop into that, that field. Um, however, I also think that we have to, in order for that to become an actual thing, um, need to have more people engaged so that um, that will create a situation where the volatility of, um, and I'm talking about Bitcoin really more than, than, than the rest on the crypto side, but I'm also talking about decentralized financial platforms um, that, that kind of have their foot in both doors, but can go either way. Like, um, I'm not going to mention names of, of stocks, but, but you know, platforms that, that allow one to um, do all of their finances that they do regularly anyway with the big banks, as well as um, investing and to be more proactive. Um, I, think, I think those areas are, are, you know, I'm very positive about them. And I do think um, the more we can engage with each other, and on platforms that are disintermediated from the rest of the financial system, I think I think the more um, the more equal the money flow will be uh, across society. Great. All right. Well. All right. So, getting to the best investment folks can make right now is to go read the book "Permanent Distortions." So, Nomi, wh where's the best place for folks to get this? Can they just go to Amazon, their local bookseller? Wh wh where's, where's the book available? Um, both of those things. Um, obviously, it's available on Amazon and other online bookstores. Um, I like to also note that independent bookstores who um, who are still around and, and everybody knows their localities. Um, there there are ways to do that. If you go to my website, basically you can you can find 
uh, a link that will take you to wherever you want to go, um, which is nomiprins.com. Um, and obviously there's, there's physical, there's audible, there's all that kind of stuff. Okay, great. When we edit this, we'll, we'll put up a link, both to your website. We'll put up the big book cover and everything. Um, you already mentioned your website. If folks want to follow you, know me, if they've really enjoyed getting to know you through this conversation, besides going to your website, you're also pretty active on Twitter too. Is that, that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So my Twitter is, um, my handle is at know me prince. So easy, easy remembering there. And, um, on Instagram, it's at real know me prince. All right. Uh, Nomi, it has been just a fantastic and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for putting all the effort into writing such a great book. Um, all right, everybody. Look, if you've enjoyed having Nomi on this program, I'd like to see her back on again in the future. Please do us a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And if you are... Um, Thinking about a lot of the macro issues that Nomi and I talked about here, maybe feeling a little uncertain about how to navigate your wealth through these times, just a reminder that you can talk to one of Wealthion's endorsed financial advisors for free. There's no commitment to work with them. Uh, these are these are financial advisors that take these macro issues into consideration when building their portfolio strategies, uh, and they'll sit down with you and have a completely free no commitment conversation with them uh, to give you their best advice on what they think you should do given your own personal situation. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, just go to wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Nomi, it's been wonderful. Really look forward to having you back on the program again in the future. We can really drill down into those solutions if you're up for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I look forward to it. Thanks so All much. Right. Such a pleasure. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.